thank you very much, Kavat Chan. Anitan, look, uh, you've mentioned Thai people a number of times, and uh, this is this is consistent with the earlier themes that we've heard from Ajahn Suchit about political social socialization. Now, this category, this this field, was very popular in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on, political culture, socialization. But perhaps that's where we need to look. Um, and Thai people, what makes Thai people ticked? It has been uh, surprising and a little bit intriguing to me, uh, under restrictive conditions uh, notwithstanding, that there is no civil war in Thailand. You know, if you look back a year ago, before the coup, there were all these reports about um, militias being set up, uh, very radical, a lot of radicalized uh, elements in the countryside and so on. And you would think that they would not approve the coup. Uh, and in fact, they would rise up against the coup. But it's been quiet. You now, there's been martial law, certainly. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of a puzzle. And I think that uh, we do need to look at um, whether culture, political culture, is static or whether it's you know, dynamic, it changes. And then under what conditions will Thai people uh, will be ticked? And then uh, they will not put up with any more. Thai people put up with a lot. We have a great tolerance. Uh, you just go out in the traffic and you see, you know, people don't, they don't honk. They don't honk. Uh, now, we have some time now for discussion. I want to, uh, at this stage, I want to thank our uh, supporters uh, from the Frederick Norman uh, Stiftung, um, uh, Mr. Siegfried Herzog uh, there, and uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Pimrapat uh, Dusadi Israeli Akun uh, also for supporting us, and we intend to have a series of these uh, platforms. So, uh, thanks very much. Floor is open. Panja, yeah. uh, uh, financial consultant. About Thai people, uh, we are talking about reforming Thai politics for Thai people. So that's uh, what you just mentioned about Thai people. Just right to the point. Uh, Thai people, because primarily we are Buddhist, so we talk about, uh, we, we may not be able to understand the eight noble solutions, but uh, the basic is uh, we go middle path. So it's a bit different from uh, the word average that uh, Dr. Panitan said is more equilibrium uh, way of doing. So we are, um, that, that's a Thai character. Um, the, the, the reform that we are talking about is trying to build a lasting harmony and prosperity for the country. I, I have a question for uh, Ajahn, Ajahn Suranan. I think you are a big supporter of liberal uh, election ele election process. Uh, uh, that is an extreme side. Another extreme is total dictatorship. Uh, currently, we are talking about about um, more equilibrium, more middle path. Uh, may may I ask you, uh, Ajahn Sulanan, uh, given the level of development of the Thai society now with majority of poor people, uh, previous government encouraged them to have built up unsus an unsustainable level of debt. Uh, can you sign me, give me an example of countries at this stage where they can prosper and go into a, have a harmony and prosperous country by having a system of liberal, really liberal democratic uh, system. Uh, just give me a few countries uh, who are successful. I, 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 I am a supporter of liberal democracy, but um, you might misunderstood me that, uh, if I'm going to go to the extreme. There are a set of values that need to be assured in a democracy. There are different stages of democracy for each, every, each and every country. Even in the United States, you know, in each and every county or state, there are different levels of um, conditions. But the practice of a democracy in the country as a whole is an accepted value. What I don't, what I don't envision, and I don't want ties to be 
is that they don't value democracy, that's all. Which a lot of people seem to be thinking that there is a value for what I call, and a lot of political scientists have called, benevolent dictatorship, um, whatever it comes down to. Is there an Eastern way of a democracy, for example, Singapore, that you, a lot of you admire? Maybe there is. But I think Thailand has passed that stage. It's a large country, it's not a city state. The Singapore is not a good example for Thailand. And is Thailand a pit against poor and the rich? I don't think so. I mean, the red shirts who came to, to protest, I always say this, they're the new middle class, like it or not. They come in, pick up trucks with mobile phones, and they have their own set of values, and they own dreams that they want to achieve. So, you know, you have to design a system that accommodates those dreams. That's all. Okay, thank you, Mr. And uh, I want to just reiterate Kun Panja's question and, and point. I think if, and let me know if I'm misrepresenting it. And it's a prevalent view. We have to take it on board. Don't have to agree, disagree, it's different. But the, 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 the notion is that there's a correlation between the level of development and the political regime type or government that the society should have. So the, the, if there's not sufficient development, then it is not ready for a full-fledged liberal democracy, liberal democratic system. That, that's more or less your question, right? Yeah. This is a prevalent notion because uh, the idea then is that if the development level is not high enough, then the citizenry is not sufficiently informed to have uh, a kind of liberal democracy. But that, that's the point that I don't agree with. Okay, that, I want to leave that because... because uh, you have to start somewhere. And who's going to say what level of development the society needs? I mean, that's why I said, you know, it's a learning process. You have to bear with it. And you have to, yes, I agree, you know, you have to get people knowledgeable, educated, uh, and be able to analyze what kind of data and what kind of information they get, but not the propaganda or the hate speech that was prevalent in the past year. Uh, Thailand, I would add, um, is it, seen as a upper middle income country even. We are stuck in this so-called income, middle income trap. So it's not a low income country, but at which point uh, at the income level, uh, would we think that we would be enough and ready to have liberal democracy? So we'll leave that uh, for the moment, and uh, I'll come tomorrow one. Ajahn Gautam touched on Article 44 of the Constitution, uh, which gives the General Prayut sweeping powers. I was wondering whether you can, some of the some of the panelists can touch, uh, reflect on this because it seems like Article 44 might be a trial balloon for a political system that can unfold in the future, drawing inspiration from, say, the Su Supreme Council of Iran, where you have the grandees determining who should contest and who shouldn't, because if you look at the general since the coup, it's a character of father knows best, the Thai people are children, and he will decide what is best and what isn't. Well, it's, it's quite a, a typical uh, article for a provincial government, you see. This, of course, you see, is quite uh, quite natural for a country uh, which is not uh, democratic. And uh, we need uh, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the N NC NCPO, right? Uh, still, still have uh, uh, some control over over the government, but you have to bear in mind it's a Thai way of controlling. Uh, how can you imagine that the head of the government and the head of NCPO is the same person? So this would help. So it doesn't mean that uh, there is there there is a conflict between the government and the NCPO. I don't think that that there is such a thing. Uh, they, they will be able to work together. If you look at this, the people in the cabinet and the people in CPO are the same group of people. So this is, is, is a, it's a provincial one. So, so don't worry much about this.
Jan Kappa, you are an expert. You know our history of constitutionalism well. Um, have you seen this before? This kind of article no. in interim charts, interim no, constitution. No, no, no. It's, 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 it, uh, yeah, it never existed before. It is the fire and uh, a new thing for us, but but it's it's, it's something like a, uh, it's a modification of the of a Sarit, I would say Sarit interim constitution. See, but uh, but the Sarit. That, that no, there was no need for for Sari to do to do uh, such a thing like this because he's, uh, he he has been able to uh, absolute to to launch uh, absolutely control over every aspect of society. But this is another thing that we have to uh, to bear in mind that uh, that uh, why the government. Uh, has been assigned to do uh, more or less a administrative work. The NCPO will take care of the so-called quote-unquote security work. But uh, I'm not very much concerned uh, about the role of uh, NP NCPO because the head of these two organizations happen to be the same one. Thanks, uh, Nirmal Ghosh from The Straits Times. Um, Prime Minister General Prayuth has um, spoken about bringing back uh, harmony, uh, uh, normalcy and harmony to Thailand and the Thai people. And we heard uh, um, Ajahn Panitan, you said uh, you were talking about bringing back the equilibrium which has existed before in Thai society. And Ajahn Gautam talked about uh, a new social contract. Uh, could be. Could I ask one of you, uh, perhaps Ajahn Gautam, to further define what you mean by a social contract? Because, because these are all. They sound the same. All these. Uh, all all these um, statements sound vaguely similar, but one also gets the sense that the horse has 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 bolted from the stable already. So when you talk about a new social contract, what exactly are you talking about? Thanks. It's the time of Rousseau, uh, for instance. <laughs> Political scientists differ <laughs> on the definition of social contracts or common goods. You, I can say that it's a little bit like uh, a piece of art, where the beauty is in the eyes of the beholders. But having said that, I'm serious. A social contract is something that we enter voluntarily, with responsibility, be answerable to the partner of the contracts. So how we are going to live together despite our differences, be it political, strength, powers, uh, economic uh, well-being and so on. So we should accept our diversity. But what will hold us together is a kind of unwritten contract. Now we don't have that. We just heard maybe somebody that liberal democracy, one man, one vote, is a dictatorship. So is it a dictatorship? That's why I ask people to enter into a social contract where maybe not everyone would agree, but I would say that most of us would be, let's say, comfortable with and by and abide by, by the contract. That's it. But it is not a written one. Not even the constitution is the new full-fledged social contract. But it has to be built all along. We shall move away a little bit from the patronage system. Is it agreeable? We shall have this, we shall have that. And that, I say, may be embodied in a kind of uh, common national values. This is in the era of political cultures and values and so on that need a lot of time to to build. And I suggest that only discussion, dialogue and discourse and so on may lead us to this kind of uh, common understanding of uh, how we shall live together with maybe say in the Buddhist way 
uh, with enough compassion and including everyone in this society in your kind of moral community. So Jean Claude Tom uh, is a French train, so so you know, Rousseau, um, and uh, ambassador of France here. Uh, in North America and elsewhere, they also have the notion of the, the consent of the governed, uh, which is almost synonymous and uh, interchangeable. But do you uh, think so? Just, just he's afraid that I would comment off the cuff, but um, and he told me to be subtle. I'll be subtle and not answer some questions. But there are two things. I think that's the social contract which talks about principles and maybe the deal to, of the government to manage in the different changing environments, the two things. Um, the government comes and goes and, you know, sometimes, for example, the Roosevelt have a new deal, the way to run governments and things like that. And one day you may run a government in a conservative manner because the society wants a more conservative government so they elected a more conservative government or more progressive it's up to the context but the social contract i think is what what kun ajan Koton is trying to say is that how can we live together as human beings as ties i think the rhetoric which is dangerous and i'm talking about both extremes don't take me wrong um, it's taking too far. I think we have to come back to the same. For me, I don't know if you all believe it, but for me, uh, and pardon for other, you know, taking the American phrase, all, hum all, all humans are created equal. I mean, we are all humans. We are all born. We are all born as humans. We are equal. But we not be equal in class, in society, in wealth. So governments are here to create equal opportunities for all. But you have to start with being equal. Because there were some rhetorics saying that we're not equal. You know, only taxpayers can vote. How can those rhetoric come out? I mean, we have to agree on that before we can move on. Okay, thank you. Um, next is Kun Achra, Bangkok Post. Uh, I'm very impressed when Ajahn Sujit mentioned the civilians' uh, control over the armed forces. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, during uh, I mean, Democrat government, they have been trying, and Ajahn Panitan was there too, they have been trying to downsize the army. And that, that is maybe just one, one time uh, in Thailand. So uh, Ajahn Panitan and Ajahn Sujit mentioned this civilians' oversight over the military. Uh, with this current context and practicality or reality, I wonder, would you pro two professors uh, could foresee how long that, or what steps that we could uh, be making towards this uh, goals? Thank you. Well, the, in fact, we say in the past two decades, we we have been uh, witnessing some sorts of uh, civilian control over the um, forces. Uh, like uh, we do have, uh, we did have a civilian uh, defense minister, and uh, the parliament control of the um, forces uh, budget. So in a way, there is uh, there has been some acceptance of the so-called uh, the the parliament con oversight of the armed forces through uh, th uh, through the allotting the budget. But uh, one other issue is quite interesting that uh, in a way of uh, uh, of appointing senior officers, you see, uh, we, how can we make it sure that there is no political interference within the appointment? Uh, 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 because it's not uh, acceptable in our society in terms of uh, appointment of the of the of the uh, by politicians or interference uh, in terms of appointment so we need to 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 bear this in mind you see but in in the area of budgeting there's no question you see the armed forces seem to agree that the parliamentary uh, that uh, the parliament uh, is also the that the final has has a final say in terms of budgeting. I think you could help actually. Uh, we we have 
been trying to uh, uh, do a military reform uh, for the past few decades without uh, public engagement much uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, civilians may feel that they are not uh, very capable of uh, handling military issues, which is not true. Uh, I've seen many good civilians uh, in Thailand. Uh, uh, sometimes they know more than the military on the issues. Uh, but uh, during uh, Khun Chuan administration uh, after 1997, uh, he was a second defense minister in the Thai history since 1932. The first is Achuong Seni Pramod in 1975. Uh, he was defense minister for one month. But Khun Chuan completed the term and was able to uh, put down a proposal to reduce about 80,000 positions uh, in the military forces. 80,000 positions seem to be a lot, but if you look at the the structure of maybe 300,000 uh, forces, uh, that's still far from what we wanted. He also was able to put a cap on the new, uh, new numbers of generals, which is more than 1,000 in Thailand, as you know. Uh, and, and more importantly, uh, the centralized budgeting process was initiated at the defense ministry, not at the armed services, for the first time. Oh, and during that time, we were able to send uh, troops to East Timor to do the peacekeeping. Uh, General Bun Sang, who worked with uh, you very closely in the, in the years, uh, was, uh, led the, that force successfully. Uh, so it proved that civilians can, can do it. In fact, uh, the soldiers told me that they very much appreciated what Kun Chuan uh, did for them, but they won't choose Democrat anyway, they told me. <laughs> because they think Democrat is a party that opposing the military for the Thai history. They said, please send thank you to him, but we won't uh, choose him. And every time when you look at the statistics at the uh, elections, uh, Democrats fail badly you know, in, in, in the military uh, areas. Pure Thai won quite interestingly in many military control areas. Uh, so that, that is very much telling you about the constituencies and the, and the voters in Thailand. Um, that progress was turned around quickly, right after the new government came in. New generals being appointed, that 80,000 positions uh, were reinstated, you know, and military budget grew, you know, and centralized command control were moved back to the armed services. I think it's time also we, uh, we look at that issue. Uh, the uh, security sector reform uh, is one of the, my responsibilities under this government. Uh, I'm asked by the defense minister and the um, deputy uh, uh, prime minister to look at this issue again. Uh, if we can uh, put in a new structure for the Thai military, uh, on one hand to look forward, uh, we have changes in the international environment, the regional environment uh, that are coming our way in a very big way. Uh, rise of China, Japan returning, U.S. Uh, repositioning, uh, 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 balancing, uh, whatever you want to call it. So that capability has to be improved. At the same time, we are looking at the Internal Security Command Operation Center uh, and the southern problems. And uh, there are some suggestions that we upgrade the ISOC or move away ISOC or maybe uh, upgrading the agencies to be able to handle a much more pressing internal security problems. But it's not yet, it's not yet uh, crystallized because I told the uh, military that reform under the military rule is it easy or difficult. Easy if you can agree on it, they can move quickly. But can the military reform themselves? Look at the US military. You know, during the histories of uh, wars, and engagement in the Middle East, they failed badly, the U.S. Uh, military, to reform themselves. Only hard lessons uh, uh, pushed uh, them, only uh, very good leadership pushed the U.S. military to reform that. So, yes, Kunachala, I think you are right that if we are successful in reforming the military, coming up with a new, more uh, modern structure, perhaps the Thai character, the, the Thai culture that look up to the military may change in the future. But for now, the Thai people said, well, we don't trust the police, we don't trust you, Ajahn, you know, you just talk, you don't do much, you know, uh, we trust the military. They do it. They come to my community 
or drug traffickers disappear, they said. So I don't know what to tell them, but uh, to tell them that it's better in principle to have a civilian control of the military. That's what I told them. Uh, I'm, I, I'm talking about uh, political reform. Political reform. Uh, Mr. Zawa from yes. the Japanese embassy. Ah, Japanese embassy, yes. That, but this is my, purely my personal uh, personal question. Yeah. <laughs> Not the official question. Uh, so the uh, ML, uh, NLC is going to start working on the political reform. So uh, the, what, what kind of a role do you expect uh, played by the international community in this reform process. Do you have any expe expectation, expectations on the international community to contribute to this process? Or uh, just uh, we international community should stand by and just following the situation? And uh, because the, in terms of the political values, the Thai society is so divided, but as uh, international community is divided as well. The Japan and US and European countries have a similar uh, political ideas and priorities, but we have another type of democracy in this in the world. So, uh, so international community is divided. So, what kind of uh, contribution, if there are any uh, contribution we can do? So, what kind of uh, support or contribution the international community uh, can provide in this your process? I'm not certain actually, because we have not seen the um, uh, members of the. Uh, National Reform Council yet, but as soon as we see the names, uh, uh, um, I believe that some of these experts uh, have already engaged with the international communities in many ways. I think through these uh, uh, subcommittees, uh, through these in the future uh, public hearings, uh, I, I, I'm sure that uh, there will be public forums and public hearings on different 11 issues plus uh, that they will move around uh, to uh, to, um, uh, to to the um, uh, provinces. I think the knowledge of the international community in getting uh, different sides uh, to come and talk and engage. How, how to handle the red shirt opinion uh, uh, leaders and the yellow church or the PDRC in the same forum? You know how 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 to talk to them first how to bring them in, and then how to talk to others, and then bring them in, and in the end, how to create a stakeholder among these different forces or leading groups. I think international community have that kind of experience that can help us to in integrate these uh, different opinions. After all, they want the same thing. As you know from the surveys, from the Asia Foundation survey, from different uh, surveys in our uh, department, you know, Ajahn Dex uh, uh, has run some surveys on the reform issues, uh, on the red shirt and others. They all want the same thing. So how to get that uh, together? I think, uh, I think the uh, international uh, agencies have that kind of experience that can help. Yeah. I think it depends on the which, uh, which area of international community would like to emphasize, you see. Uh, it, it, it seemed to me that if you are uh, talking about uh, political reform or democratic reform, you see, uh, the experience of a very successful democracies, uh, particularly uh, in this area, is quite interesting. For instance, in the case of Japan, you see, uh, I would say that a number of people in the NRC would be able, would like to listen more from the success of Japan after the Second World War that you can shift from the military dominated uh, regime into a very liberal uh, civilian regime, uh, let alone that uh, the war uh, the war would uh, help, you see. The Second World War would help uh, Japan to, uh, to get rid of the military dominated regime. Nevertheless, you see, the Japanese uh, uh, also is an Asian country and Japan's uh, political system is a constitutional monarchy. It's very similar to, to, to Thailand. And Japan is the one who are who is the one uh, the one who is able to 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 harmonize between the very traditional values with a new values. You see, 
and uh, with traditional values and the capitalism and so on and so forth. And so it might be useful from my personal view, you see, from the, my point of view, that uh, the experience of the country like this, you see, would be able to, to be uh, helpful. Uh, I, uh, we, we don't have to listen more. Uh, the people always look at the U.S. and see, and the Western Europe with different, different uh, political and uh, atmosphere. But we have to look uh, to our in this area, and and uh, uh, and because Japan is a constitutional monarchy, I think we, we should learn from you. So, thank you. Um, I'm Zirit Laksana. I'm from the National Anti-Corruption Commission. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, respond to the, the Japanese uh, diplomat about the international community. Um, the Anti-Corruption Commission has proposed several measures to reform the electoral pro process. And um, basically, w one, one reform that we proposed was um, for politicians when they're campaigning um, not only we, we don't want to interfere with what they the, the policies that they're proposing, but if they could put up, um, you know, the amount of money that's required. For example, um, recently that during the last election that that became you know, default election, um, there was um, post, there were posters saying that um, the. Uh, the um, pension or, or for, for seniors would be increased from 500 baht per month to 3,000 baht per month. Now, uh, if they propose something like that, we don't interfere with that, but if they could uh, also uh, put up on their posters how much it would cost. Um, it's not difficult to calculate. We know how many senior citizens there are, um, how much it would cost in total, uh, and where the money would com be coming from. Would they be increasing some taxes? Which taxes? Uh, would they be um, uh, cancelling some programs uh, in order to uh, obtain the, the funds for, for this um, policy? Or would they have to borrow? Borrow domestically or, or internationally? And I spoke to the outgoing um, Australian Ambassador, Ambassador James Wise, about this. And, and he said that in Australia, um, there's something called the budgetary honesty. Uh, and so that kind of input from the international community, I think, would be very useful uh, for Thailand going forward in its reform. So I'd just like to, yes, I'm out of time. Uh, observation, observation and a question. Observation is that the uh, Thailand politics, uh, the squabble between uh, sure, two sure, masses, yeah, sure. to, 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 uh, squabble between two masses, and it needs the end of the barrel to end this uh, squabble. The question is, uh, how important is the effect, the specter of uh, succession, uh, made the necessity to stage the coup? We, we uh, academics uh, uh, love to have uh, grand theories. And we think our beloved grand theories, uh, or one grand theory, can explain all anomalies, anomalies, you know, in the social sciences. Uh, I, I was disappointed when I learned that myself when I completed my dissertation that my so-called grand theory doesn't explain the world the way I like to. Uh, it would be a very beautiful world if one, uh, you know. Um, powerful factor uh, can uh, lead to all uh, explanations. But granted that, uh, I think, yes, uh, uh, in a way, um, issues of changing leadership at different levels uh, uh, ha has created concerns uh, for many, for many times. Uh, uh, we are a changing society, you look at uh, different uh, level of leadership in, in, in many institutions, um, but um, this is not new. Uh, succession has been done of, of more than 800 years. I think the institution know best how to handle that. In fact, uh, customs, you know, and 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 rules and regulations governing that. Uh, in, in in other words, when you look at the uh, legal issues, when you looking at uh, this is according to the expert. Uh, looking at legal issues, looking at uh, uh, custom issues, there, there's no surprises uh, in in that uh, in, in in that succession. But in terms of emotion, of course, of course, uh, I think the attachment to 
uh, his match as the king uh, uh, is one of the strongest you know, in, in, the, in, in, the, in the recent histories in Thailand, or if not the history of Thailand. Um, so uh, that kind of uh, emotional uh, uh, attachment uh, may uh, create some uneasy feelings uh, among uh, uh, many quarters, uh, including uh, foreign friends, investors, allies, uh, and I noticed that investors, uh, particularly certain uh, magazines, certain writers, uh, often use that one theory. I'm not so sure why we have talked at, at length about uh, those observations. In, 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 in social sciences, this is not the right way to approach our complex problems. Uh, our problem is a problem of changing society, like that and said, and um, upper middle income declared by uh, you know, uh, United Nations when we achieved Millennium Development Goal in 2011. Uh, so you have a lot of complicated forces uh, that at work. Uh, the changes in the military is also critical. Uh, after this uh, uh, leadership, uh, you, you may see a, a much different uh, leadership uh, coming up. Changes at the uh, uh, bureaucracy is also quite noticeable. Uh, you notice that uh, it's a new young generation of a bureaucracy. And of course, on the ground, you have new generations of the red shirt, you know, middle class and others. So all this will be uh, con contested, you know, in, in, in our changing society. It's important, that's why, to have the reform uh, uh, structure in order for them uh, to engage and share and also to compromise and move on, yes. Thank you, Ajahn Bernie Chan. Uh, Ajahn Kotom requests two sentences, and Ajahn Sujit will have the last word. One sentence, he said. Yes. Please don't give too much credit to conspiration theory, which sometimes may be valid, but most of the time, pure speculation. First sentence. Second <laughs> sentence. I'd like to thank the international community here present, we need your help and a lot more if you like to support the state process which is going on, please do so. But if you would like to support civil society in participating in this important process where we need more participation, please also do so. Thank you. My view is, is the bottom line of political reforms uh, is the reform of the, our political culture and in order to make it sure that uh, democracy is the only game in town. Thank you. Very well put, Ajahn Kappa. Let me just say our next event, uh, on the 30th of October, we have, we're going to focus on the Thai economy next. Uh, multinationals, value chains and regional integration, what's in it for Thailand, the fly is outside. On November 3rd, it's Geopolitics, ASEAN China, and you'll have information later on. And then uh, later in November, we want to do something on the mainland Southeast Asia and Mekong. So uh, we have titled it uh, The Axis of the Mekong Region, The Axis of Prosperity, Security, and Competition. So that's, I think, November 21st, but we'll send you details. Please join me in thanking the speakers, and thank you for coming.